Welcome to rest. Circle, circle, dot, dot. Now I got my to piece together this broken glass. Our God runs toward, not away from the mess. Think about that. We're talking about the creator of everything that had legions of demons in him, and he cast him into the pigs. Pigs ran off to the mountain. But this morning, we're more importantly going to set down. We're going to spend a little bit of time looking at Jesus as a healer. And, and what does that mean? What are the implications for you and I? Jesus as healer. How many believe that our God is bigger than all things? Could have fooled me. How many believe that our God is bigger than all our ailments, all the battles we face? Yeah. Um, so this morning we're going to really, really look at that. And our text today is, is the perfect definition of juxtaposition. Um, juxtaposition, the, the literal definition is the fact of two things being seen or placed close together with contrasting effect. Okay, so there are two things that look very similar but yet have stark differences. And, and we'll see this as we go throughout the text that there is lots of situations of juxtaposition. Um, the theme of our message is simple. And I'm going to have you say this multiple times. It is Jesus, Lord of all and over all things. Jesus, Lord of all and over all things. I'm a, I'm a big systematic theological, theology buff. I mean, that's, that's my world. That's where I want to live. And so I always try to bring everything back to the gospel and make foundational statements that we can glean from, that we can learn from, and that we can hold true to when it comes to the gospel, and this is one of those. Jesus is Lord of all and over all things. Let's say it together. Jesus, Lord of all and over all things. Say that again. Jesus, Lord of all and over all things. As we move about today, as we look into the scriptures, my goal is to give you a glimpse at the breadth, the depth of Jesus' power over all things. There is nothing that can bind his power. There is nothing outside of his reach. He is above all things. And so, as we look in Mark chapter 5 today, we're going to see the two final miracles of the score of three in this particular chapter. And we're basically going to look at a sandwich story. Okay, The, the scripture is like an Oreo this morning. How many of you like Oreos? Me, I mean, it's my favorite. Literally, it's my favorite. My wife has cut me off. Um, she will not buy them at the store. I've begged. In fact, last week when she, when we got back from our trip, she went grocery shopping on Monday, and I came into the house after work, and my first question was, where's my Oreos? And she said, I'm not buying you Oreos anymore. And I was like, but Why? Oh, no. And I started to die on the inside a little. But she loves me, so she also knows that when I eat, I literally eat half of the, not the normal size, but the jumbo size every time I sit down. I am, as I said to you, I am, uh, if, if you haven't been around rest for a while, I'm a fat person in remission. Um, I, I just recently lost 75 pounds. I, I was, I was, uh, I was, you know, I, I like to eat cake. I don't know what else to tell you. And Oreo is my favorite. But our story today is much like an Oreo. We're going to see kind of s the beginning of our text, a story that happens in the middle, and the first story ends again. So Oreo, all right? So we're going to start Mark chapter 5, 21 through 43, verse 21. And when Jesus had crossed again the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered around him. And he was beside the sea. Then came one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus, by name. And seeing him, he fell at his feet and implored him earnestly, saying, My little girl is at the point of death. Come lay your hand on her so that she may be well, may well and live. And he went with him. And a great crowd followed him and thronged about him. And there was a woman who had discharge of blood for 12 years and who had suffered much under many physicians, and had spent all she had, and was no better, but rather grew worse. 
And she heard the reports of Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. For she said, if I touch even his garments, I will be made well. And immediately the flow of blood dried up. And she felt in her body that she had been healed of her disease. And Jesus, perceiving in himself the power had gone out from him, immediately turned in the crowd and said, Who touched my garments? And his disciples said to him, You see the crowd pressing around you, and yet you say, Who touched me? And he looked around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. Verse 34, And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. While he was still speaking, there came from the ruler's house some who said, Your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? Verse 36, But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the ruler of the synagogue, Do not fear, only believe. And he allowed no one to follow him except Peter and James and John, the brother of James. They came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue, and Jesus saw a commotion, people wailing, uh, weeping and wailing loudly. And when he had entered, he said to them, Why are you making a commotion and weeping? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. But he put them all outside and took the child's father and mother and those who were with him. And went where the child was, taking her by the hand. He said, Talithia kumi, which means, little girl, I say to you, arise. And immediately the girl got up and began walking. For she was 12 years of age, and they were immediately overcome with amazement. And he strictly charged them that no one should know this. And they told, and told them to give her something to eat. Let's pray. Heavenly Father God, Lord, we come to you this morning. I pray that you would open our eyes, that you would open our hearts, that, our, that Lord, that you would put us in a spirit that would be willing to receive. To receive your truth, your proclamation, your scriptures. That, Lord, that we would store up your word, as David says, that we may not sin against you, God. Let this be a catalyst moment for us as a church today. Let this be a transformational moment for us in our walks with Christ. That, Lord, that we would be bold in our faith. That, as Paul says, that we would not be ashamed of the gospel. Because it is the life-giving salvation that frees us from our bondage. Lord, have your way. It is in Jesus' name that we pray. I'm going to move very quickly because our invitation today is what the majority point of our text is about. Verse 21, and when Jesus had crossed again to the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered about him and he was beside the sea. So the first thing that we see here is Jesus returns back home. If you've been following along with us during this message in the Gospel of Mark, we see that Jesus' home base or Jesus' home community is Capernaum. Say Capernaum. Capernaum. Capernaum Capernaum is um, a part of the region of Galilee, right? Galilee is this mainly royal area. It's where all the country bunkins live. That's you and me. Kentucky royal. Okay, forget it. Anyways, so Jesus has basically been sequestered to the royal area of of, of the nation of Israel. And the reason why is because his popularity has grown so much so that everywhere he goes, people want a piece of him. They want to touch him. They want to see him. And so also he knows that the Pharisees are plotting to kill him. So he kind of has to say in these areas, these remote areas to teach. Well, here's the great thing is what we know is when the spirit of the Lord is, people will come. The scriptures say, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men to me. And it is the truth in both John the Baptist and Jesus, these people are flocking to come see him. And so he comes to Capernaum, which is on the shore of the Sea of Galilee. And the first thing I want to point out is we have a major juxtaposition here. What is this? Two things that look similar, but very different. Well, if you 
were here last week, if you weren't, I'll remind you and I'll tell you kind of where I'm getting at, is we had a situation where Jesus healed a man who was demonically possessed and he cast the man or the legion of demons out of him and throws them into a herd of swine. I heard of pigs. And when the pigs receive the demons, they run and jump off of the cliff. Well, when they do that, everybody in the town freaks out, and especially the guy who owns the pigs. He's like, hey, bro, those were my pigs. I like bacon. Actually, no, he didn't because he was a Jew. But we like bacon, right? Can I get an amen on that? You people better wake up. About to bring the bad me out. But we see in verse 17 of chapter 5, we see Jesus does this, and they begin to what? Beg Jesus to depart. Dude, you got to get out of here. You're turning our town upside down. You, you need to leave. You need, your welcome has been wore out. Deuces. Don't let the door hit you with the good Lord split you. That's kind of what they're doing here. Jesus, get out of our town. Well, we come to verse 21, and here's the juxtaposition. And when Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a what? A great crowd is waiting on him. They are waiting on him. Is Jesus coming? Maybe, maybe it's kind of like your dog does. My dog does this. Like, like she just like waits there like, is that daddy? Is that, is that daddy? And then the moment I walk in, she's like, ah! It's the same thing. The people in Capernaum, they're waiting. They're looking over the Sea of Galilee. They're like, is Jesus coming? Is Jesus coming? Is Jesus coming? Because they're eager with expectation that when Jesus shows up, something great will happen. How many of you came to church this morning? Be honest. Don't give me the fake you know, church stuff because I know when you're in the car you're looking at your husband, you're like, I'll kill you. How many of you came with eager expectation that God would do something today? That's, that's what the people in Capernaum are doing. They're waiting on Jesus with eager expectation, juxtaposition, two different communities with two total radical different responses. Verse 22, Then came one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name, and seeing him, he fell at his feet. And he implored him earnestly, saying, My little daughter is at the point of death. Come lay your hands on her so that she may be made well and live. Jairus is the ruler of the synagogue, which is a layman group of guys who have uh, um, administration and maintenance or custodial duties in the house of worship. Be much kind of like our modern day deacons are in our church. He's not the pastor Rather, he selects the the priest or the rabbi who will read the daily scripture and teach from the Torah or give the reading of the prophets. And so we see here that this particular man comes to Jesus in desperation. What is peculiar about this is if you rewind in the book of Mark, Mark chapter 3, Jesus heals a guy who has a withered hand. And he does it on the Sabbath. And the Pharisees lose their mind. They're like, you you can't do that on the Sabbath. That's working. And Jesus shakes them off. He says, man, or the Sabbath wasn't made for man. Man was made for the, or vice versa. Man was not made for the Sabbath. Sabbath was made for man. And so in this moment, when Jesus heals this guy with a withered hand, they begin to plot to kill him. And Jairus is a part of that group who's plotting to kill Jesus. Now, what has changed? Why is Jairus all of a sudden willing to come in front of God and everybody else in the middle of broad daylight to fall at his knees and say, teacher, Come heal my little girl. Come touch my little girl that she may be made well. What has changed? His priorities have been realigned, which has realigned his stance on who Jesus is. See, when we're desperate, when your house is about to be foreclosed upon, when you're 
marriages on the rocks or on the brink of divorce, you begin to do things, or I hope you begin to do things that are different than the way you were doing them before. So that you might save what you have invested your time in. In the same way, Jairus has came and he is saying to Jesus, I am desperate. I need you. Help me, please. Don't miss this. Don't, 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 don't miss this. Jesus does not look at him and say, hey, weren't you a part of that group who was talking about killing me? Jesus isn't petty like you and I are. Can we all be honest? Can we all be honest? Because you know what we do? Our typical response there is, uh, uh, I wasn't good enough for you last week, so don't come to me needing something now. Some of y'all don't even know what to do right now because I'm reading your book. You treat people like that. But Jesus is the perfect example for us. Jesus is showing us that we as Christ followers, we as image bearers of the Son of God, we don't treat people petty. No, we say we will meet you in your need. We will help you in your time of need. Because what we know is we have been greatly forgiven. We were the great transgressors. We stood opposed to God, and yet he spoke our name. He called us out of our sin and our bondage, and he gave us freedom. Therefore, we as Christ followers, we don't need to be petty. We don't need to be petty. We don't need to look at the world and say, I wasn't good enough for you then. I'm not good enough for you now. If that's you, you are in sin. Yes, I pointed my finger at you. Because that's me sometimes too. Because sometimes I'm just like, ah, I don't want to deal with it. I don't want to deal with them. They're always, oh, oh my gosh, they're a, they're a social piranha, a leech on my life. But Christ has called me to love them, to meet them in their moment, just as he does here with Jairus. Just how desperate is Jairus? He falls at the feet of Jesus in broad daylight for everyone to see. Jairus approaches Jesus without his pride, his social standing in mind, but rather with a knowledge that it will take a touch of the master to heal his girl. Let let me add on top of this. Why would he do it? Because as Luke 8.42 tells us, he points out that this is Jairus' only daughter. And one thing I know is that daddies love their little girl. Daddies adore their little girl. Yeah, they're boys. Yeah, they're boys. They're whatever. But when it comes to their little girl, don't you mess with their little girl. Amen, Randy? Jairus on his knees, he says, come lay your hands on her so that she may be made well and live. He came to Jesus because he has firsthand knowledge of the power that Jesus wields and possesses. And let, me, let me just rewind you here. In Capernaum alone, Jesus has made multiple healings. In this particular community, Jesus has done multiple things. Mark 1, Jesus heals a man with an unclean spirit. He heals many others, including Peter's mother-in-law. Mark 2, Jesus heals the paralytic man who is lowered through the roof as Jesus is teaching. Mark 3, Jesus heals a man with a weathered hand on the Sabbath in the synagogue. He knows full well that Jesus has all the power necessary to help his little girl. So that's why Jairus is at the feet of Jesus. Verse 24, and he went with him. And a great crowd followed him and thronged about him. I want to I want you to notice something. There isn't this debate or this dialogue between Jesus and Jairus when Jairus falls at the feet of Jesus. Jesus doesn't say, tell me a little bit more. No, Jesus goes with him. Jesus is a man of action. Everything he does is deliberate and methodical, and that is exactly what Jesus does here. He takes Jairus immediately, and he goes with him. And a great crowd followed him and thronged him. As we said a few weeks ago, Jesus has basically became this rock star in the communities surrounding Capernaum and Capernaum alone. Everywhere he goes, there are people trying to touch him, trying to be with him, and and, and they want a moment of Jesus' time, just like Jairus here and and he, he 
The Greek transliterates to this word, they thronged about him. You know what that means? They're essentially physically accosting Jesus as he's trying to walk. I mean, have you ever watched um, like, like a UFC fight when they come to, when they're going to the arena, there's like 12 security guys and they're all like making way or the, or the uh, secret service for the president. They're like, literally, they don't care about your baby. They're pushing people down, making way so that they can move. This is essentially what's happening here. Except Jesus is disciples. They're not bodyguards. They're not secret service agents. They're just disciples. They're random dudes like you and me. And so everywhere Jesus goes, there are people like reaching over, grabbing, pushing, stopping, preventing Jesus from moving about. Now that will play into our story this morning. Verse 25 and 26, and when... There was a woman who had discharge of blood for 12 years and who had suffered much under many physicians and had spent all she had and was no better but grew worse. John Mark opens the door to a new character here in the scriptures. While the New Testament does not reveal this woman's name, church tradition teaches us that her name is Veronica. Say Veronica. Veronica, after this particular incident, becomes a prominent figure in the church of Caesarea Philippi. In fact, she goes on to build this bronze statue in her front yard of her house of of this exchange between her and Jesus. In fact, in 2nd uh, 2nd century, church historians write that they went to Caesarea Philippi and laid eyes on this particular statue. You know, why do I tell you that? Because it's an extra biblical source that corroborates what the scripture teaches us. So, John Mark opens the door to Veronica. Veronica has had a constant discharge of blood or a constant menstrual cycle for the last 12 years. She, like Jarius, is desperate for healing. Can you imagine how that she felt physically, mentally, emotionally. She probably looks many years older than she actually is from her body constantly losing blood, being weak and fatigued, anemic. How about mentally? How do you think that she felt mentally she's broken down and beaten she's tried everything that her modern day medicine could tell her to try in fact she's tried such things that the Talmud describes like eating uh, other animals dung drinking lots and lots of wine some of you are like that's not a bad thing but the scripture says that she has gotten worse rather than gotten better And if you don't understand the law, there's one key thing that you're going to miss from this text. Leviticus chapter 15 deals explicitly with discharge and has a whole section about women who have elongated discharge or elongated menstrual cycles such as this woman. And we see in verse 25, it says, If a woman has discharge of blood for many days, not at the time of her menstruation and purity, or if she has a discharge beyond the time of her impurity, all the days of discharge, she shall continue in uncleanliness. As in the days of her impurity, she shall be unclean. Okay, what does that mean? That means she is completely cut off from everyone and every thing she would be completely destitute and alone she if she's married she can't sleep in the bed with her husband if she has kids she can't sit in the same chairs that they do she can't lay in the same bed she can't touch their cups she can't make their meals she is alone she is socially ostracized she is treated just the same just the same almost as someone who had leprosy We see that she suffered this for 12 years. 12 years. She's been alone, an outcast, 
pushed away. Twelve years. So what's the juxtaposition there? We see that Jairus' daughter is 12 years old and that this woman has suffered for 12 years. 12 years of joy and excitement. And Jairus' daughter is about to move to outer, outer darkness. And this particular woman has suffered for 12 years. Verse 27, though. She had heard the reports about Jesus and came up from behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. Heard reports about Jesus. She had heard reports about Jesus. What do you think that she's heard? I'm going to tell you what she's heard. She's heard that Jesus does not reject the rejected of this world. Rather, Jesus binds up the brokenhearted. He mends and heals those who are sick and who are far from him. Those whose lives are total wrecks, Jesus fixes them. Those are the reports that she has heard. I want to tell you this morning, if you came into this place, your life is wrecked. You can't seem to get your junk together. Your marriage is a mess. Your finances are a mess. Your kids are so bad, you don't even like them. I want to tell you there's hope in Jesus. Because Jesus came for you. I want you to hear me. I want you to hear me. Might, you might hear at another church, Jesus came for those who are in a suit and tie and look good, drive the nice car. I want to tell you that's hogwash, and that's the exact opposite of what the gospel tells us. The gospel says that Jesus came for the sick, those who are broken, those who are in need of the master's touch. He came for you. That's who Jesus came from. And that's the reports that she's heard. She's heard people say such things like, he heals lepers. He doesn't say, get away from me, get out of my face, oh, you lepers. No, 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 no. He says, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden. I'll fix you, homie. That's what he says. And so she's heard the reports and she comes to Jesus. But notice, we see that she come, came up from behind him. See, she remembers Leviticus chapter 15. She knows her social status. She knows that she is unclean, that anybody she touches will also, in passing, be unclean. In case you don't know what that means, that means in the different, in the different types of touches, they can be unclean for up to seven days, meaning that they, they can't go out. They can't have dinner with anybody else. They can't talk to anybody else. They can't shake their hand. Can't open their door. None of that. They're, they're completely cast out. And so she knows her status. Every person that she touches will be unclean. So I would imagine she's very deliberate in her approach to Jesus. Very deliberate. And she, she comes up from behind him. Almost like a thing of secrecy. A thing of shame. Maybe you're here today and you feel that same shame. But she says in her mind, verse 28, If I touch even his garments, I will be made well. She has the faith to believe that if she would touch the hem of his garment, what is called to as the talit, say talit, Talit, the talit is the blue tassel portion that was on a Jewish male's robe. This talit, or the blue border portion, was on every single male's robe or tunic. It was to symbolize the direct relationship between God and the nation of Israel. That God will always protect the borders of Zion. And so they all wore it. And so when she says in her mind, if I touch even the tassel, if I just touch that blue border, I will be made whole again. Verse 29. And immediately the flow of blood dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. Immediately, the power of Jesus is real and immediate. I want you to hear me. The power of Jesus is real and immediate. 
To, to us in our postmodern world as a 21st century American, right now in your mind, that feels so far removed from you. You, you might sit there and you might be like, oh, that sounds like a great Bible story. You don't know what that means. You don't understand the implications that Jesus' touch is immediate. Let's look on. Verse 30. And Jesus, perceiving in himself that the power had gone out from him, immediately turned around about in the crowd and said, who touched me? Do you remember that portion I was talking about earlier where Jesus gets off the boat and he's being treated like a rock star and everybody's wanting to touch him and he's, he's getting thronged about, as the scripture says? Let me physically, they're like accosting him, touching him. Jesus, 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 Jesus. And Jesus isn't, you know, can't touch us. It's not Jesus in this moment. Jesus stops immediately in his tracks and he says, Who touched me? Who did it? Who did it? Who touched me? And verse 31, the disciples said exactly what you and I would say, right? Like, Jesus, you're basically playing football out there, trying to get to Jairus' house, and you're going to ask, who touched you? Who touched you? Come on, man, be for real. Who touched you? That's exactly what the disciples say. You see the crowd pressing around you, and yet you say, who touched me? Jesus, that's an audacious question. Who touched me? But Veronica knew. She knew exactly who he was talking about. Verse 33, we see she comes and she finds herself in the exact same position as Jairus. Once again, we see that juxtaposition. Except she's already received healing and she is bowing before Jesus. And she begins to lay out everything that's going on. Can you imagine the sorrow and the joy That she has in this moment. She said she's probably talking loud and fast like a woman who gets excited. I've been bleeding for 12 years. Uh, My body has been weak. I I have been broken down. I've lost everything. I have no money. I spent it all doing these random, ridiculous things these physicians have told me. And and I believed in a moment that when I touched your your talit, when I touched the talit, that I would be healed. And I was, Jesus. I was, I was, I was. Jesus' response in verse 34 is the exact opposite of what I would imagine the modern day rabbi during this time would have said. Jesus says, daughter. Daughter. Your faith has made you well. See, the modern day rabbi would have scolded her. Why? Because by touching the modern day rabbi, she would have made him unclean. She would have prevented him from doing his job, from carrying out and exercising of the Levitical law. How dare you touch me? What do you mean? But no, Jesus calls her the exact same Greek word that Jairus calls his daughter. Help my daughter. It is the only time in all of the New Testament that we see Jesus use this term for any single person. He looks Veronica in the eye and says, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. This term here, go in peace and be healed of your disease. The peace, we all know what the Jewish word for peace is, right? It's shalom. But the implication of this particular instance here is bigger than your just typical shalom. No, Jesus 
says for her to go into complete shalom, which basically means that Jesus has not just healed her physical body, but Jesus has made her relationship between him and her right and in good standing. She has met the king. She has received relationship with Jesus. As we know, Veronica is never the same. She becomes a very prominent woman in following Christ. Go in peace. For the typical rabbi, he would have been unclean. But what we see here is we see the power and the authority of Jesus. In the moment when she touched, Jesus' power overcame the earthly rituals of the biblical law. It overcame her physical ailments because in that exact moment she was healed. That's the power that our Savior wields. How do you think Jer- uh, Jairus is acting right now? I mean, let's, let's be honest. Jairus just came. He's like, dear Jesus, dear Jesus, my daughter, my daughter, my daughter, come help me, come help me, come help me. And they're walking, they're walking. And all of a sudden, Jesus gets touched, and he's like, who touched me? And then he, he, he's probably like you are at the doctor's office or even the restaurant. Like you walk up to the hostess, walls party of four, walls party of four, and you go sit down. And then in comes this other family, and they get their seat before you do. And you want to be like, I was here first. Hey, me. You're setting us out. We was here first. How many of you do that? That, That's the way you respond. And I bet you that's how Jairus is thinking. He's like, do you understand? My daughter is dying. You already healed her. You could have went on, man, like a third base coach waving on. Let's go. Let's go. Why would Jesus do that? Why would Jesus pause and have this conversation? Doesn't he understand? Verse 35. While he was still speaking, while Jesus is speaking, people came from the ruler's house, from Jairus' house, and said, Your daughter is dead. Talk about some soft language. You know, I, 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 if you come to me and you say that, just be like, hey, they didn't make it. Don't be like, they're dead. Your daughter is dead. But I want, I want to underscore something here for you. Why trouble the teacher any further? Why trouble the teacher any further? Jairus' heart would have been broken in this moment. His legs would have been weak, probably having trouble standing. His, his eyes beginning to pull with tears and Could you imagine the emotion? He's probably thinking, why did I even come out here? I missed the final moments. I could have held her hand. That wrecks people's lives when they don't get the chance to be there with their loved ones. Jesus, knowing this, looks into the heart of Jairus. And what does he say in verse 36? But overhearing it, Jesus said to the ruler, do not fear, but believe. So why would they say, Don't trouble the teacher any further. I want to tell you what that means. The implications are is that they didn't believe that Jesus wielded the power to heal the little girl even when she was dead. They were like, ah, yeah, you know, people withered hands, demon-possessed people. He's got all that. But we're talking about a whole nother kit and caboodle. This is dead people. But Jesus says, do not fear only believe. He essentially is saying, shut out the world and hold tightly to me. Hold firm in your faith in me. Remember what you've seen me do. Remember what you just saw me do to this woman. Fear not. Believe in me. Believe in my authority. Believe in my power. Jesus could have pressed on when he healed Veronica. Jesus could have kept on going because the deed was already done. But why did Jesus stop? I want to tell you two reasons why Jesus stopped. Number one, he stopped for Jairus. Why did he stop for Jairus? Because he knew that if they just kept on going down the road, eventually somebody would meet them and say, hey, your daughter is dead, and he would have been downtrodden. But he could let Jairus glean 
that moment that he had just seen physical healing. He stopped because he wanted a a faith of testimony, a witness of testimony that God's power is all sufficient in our times of need. And number two, Jesus stopped for me and you. He stopped for me and you because he wants to remind each and one of us is that his time, his will is outside of our realm of understanding. See, you might right right now be facing a trial and a tribulation. You're like, where is my salvation? Where is my hope? Where is that at? When is redemption going to come? When is victory going to come? And I'm going to tell you that God is rest assured going to bring you victory. It is happening. I can't guarantee you victory is going to come in this life, but I can guarantee you and victory is going to come in the life to come. Victory is coming your way. Jesus operates outside of our realm of understanding of time and space. Verse 37, Jesus doesn't let anybody else go with him except for James, John, and Peter. Verse 38, they come to Jairus' house and they see this great commotion going on. They, They see this loud wailing, people weeping and wailing loudly. Verse 39, it says, And when they entered, he said to them, Why are you making a commotion and weeping? The child is not dead, but sleeping. I want to pause there. Why is this going on? Because during this time, they didn't have Facebook. They didn't send out obituaries to the newspaper to let everybody know you died. No, what they did is they hired professional mourners who would show up at your house and who would scream and well as loud as they possibly can so that the whole neighborhood would know that somebody died. That's how they did it. And these people were paid to literally show up and boo-hoo and cry. It sounds like a lot of fun, right? They're professional mourners. But Jesus said, why are you making a commotion? She's only sleeping. Verse 40, what does it say they did? They laughed at him. That's how you know it wasn't genuine. They went from, ah! They scorn Jesus. Are you an idiot? I mean, they're probably going, they're probably going, um, you know, with all due respect, we're professional mourners. We know a stiff when we see one. That's that's literally they're scorning Jesus. They're saying, we know dead people. That's what we do. But Jesus says she's only sleeping. The allegorical term for the space between life and death. But Jesus put them outside. I don't know about you, but I want to know how Jesus did it. Jesus put them outside. I I just wonder, do you think Jesus used his powers and like levitated them and then like threw them out? One at a time. I, I probably didn't do that. Just, but Jesus puts them out. He kicks everybody out except for mother, father, James, Peter, and John. And they go up to this little girl's room. And he said in her native household tongue in Aramaic, to Litha. Kumi, which means, little girl, I say to you, arise. Jesus physically touches her hand, and scholars believe probably the best translation of her, of him speaking to her in Aramaic was, little lamb, arise. Little lamb, arise. Little lamb, arise. A, A very Near and dear term of endearment. Just as us saying maybe to, maybe you're a daddy who calls your little girl pumpkin. Pumpkin, come on, baby. Come on, little lamb. And verse 42, and immediately the girl got up and began to walk, and they were astonished. 
They were amazed. Jesus gives instant healing again. So what's the implication for us as a church and as Christ followers? What's the implications for us? What do I mean by that? What does, what does that mean? How do I literally put this, this scripture, these words into context into my life? What, how do I live this out, Pastor? Yeah, it sounds good. Jesus is a healer. But what does that mean for me? Number one, our God is all powerful. Jesus is Lord of all and over all things. There is nothing outside of his reach or grasp. There is no sickness, no trial, no tribulation, no demon, no angel, nor any death bigger than our Jesus. Hey, thanks for hanging out with us today. We pray that this message has challenged, encouraged, and shaped you a little more into the person that God dreamed you would be. If you've been blessed in any way through the ministry of Rest Church or you have a prayer request, we want you to go to our app under the prayer request section and submit that so we can see how God is impacting your story. We were never meant to do life alone, and so we're so thankful for a family like you to do life with. In fact, it's your generosity that's helped spread the gospel here at Rest Church. And so if you would like to give, feel free to do so by texting the word GIVE, G-I-V-E, to 270-366-7947 and follow with your dollar amount. Thank you so much for letting us speak truth into your life through God's word week to week. Have an amazing day.